Thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. All right, so it's only 15 minutes, so I wanted to tell you about Electric well, Curiosity, but um, some introduction to 2D fluid dynamics. Okay, so, so let's consider bounded domain in the plane M, let's say simply connected to fixed ideas. And inside this container, this fluid vessel, there's a homogeneous um, incompressible medium fluid, which is described by a velocity vector field. And for most of the talk, I'll just talk about two dimensions. And this vector field is moving according to the uh, incompressible Euler equation. Okay, so the rate of change is the material advection by itself, forced by a pressure. The pressure is a scalar field that's maintaining this incompressibility constraint that the velocity be divergence free for all time. And this container is solid, so there's no flux of fluid on the boundary. And of course, you supply it with initial condition at time zero. And this belongs to some suitable phase space for the fluid. We'll discuss that in a second. Okay, so these are the so-called Eulerian equations that tell you how to advance the velocity vector field through time if it moves in this inviscid, incompressible way. Um, there's an alternative Lagrangian viewpoint, which maybe I'll take a second to mention, um, which is that if you look at the configuration space of the fluid, it's actually, um, let's call it D mu M, the collection of smooth um, volume preserving diffeomorphisms that leave the boundary invariant. The fluid is just rearranging particles, labels inside this container in such a way that nothing on the boundary is moving. And on the configuration space, you could think of fluid motion as just energy minimizing. So if you try to connect the identity to some other configuration, critical points of the energy functional, which is just the velocity square essentially integrated over space and time, are exactly these Euler solutions. And this point of view is used by, for example, Arnold in saying that Euler motion is geodesic on the group of volume preserving diffeomorphisms. Okay. So now in 2D, we can say a lot more than in higher dimensions. One reason is that there's a Hamiltonian for the velocity, which we can call C for the stream function. It's a scalar function such that the velocity is the skew gradient of the scalar function. Okay, so grad per is just minus D2. What it means is that if you take a level set of this function psi, then the velocity is tangent to that, right? So the velocity is pointing along this level set. So as such, these level sets are called streamlines of the flow. Particles move along there. So of course, you can change in time, and these levels can change in time, but at least in the stationary case, this is the, the full picture of particle motion. Okay. Another scalar that greatly simplifies the problem is the vorticity. The vorticity can be defined in any dimension as a two-form, which is transported by the velocity as a two-form. But in two dimensions, you can identify it with a scalar. And it's transported as a scalar field. Here, let me, in fact, just replace the velocity by the stream function that I just introduced. And in terms of the stream function, the vorticity is just the velocity. So this is now a coupled non-local equation that you can use to determine, okay, I need, I need boundary conditions for the stream function, say so zero you can use to determine and advance the fluid for all time because it's incompressible. There's not a, there's not a um, potential part to keep track of, just the rotational piece. 
And so this is this is equivalent formulation of the 2D Euler equation. Okay, so what's known about all positiveness of these equations? Well, there's classical theorems that go back to, I guess, the 1930s by uh, Wolibner and Holder, which say that if you take any alpha positive and you take an initial vorticity and see alpha, then there exists a unique vorticity field later in time, which is C alpha. Okay, so C alpha is a good phase space for the system for all time, but norms in this space can grow. So you have a double exponential bound. You have some control on the C alpha norm of the solution, but it could in principle grow double exponentially. And in fact, the fact that it can grow double exponentially was resolved in the case of this disk by Kiselev and Schwerak. So in that sense, this is a good space to think about the equations, but at long time, it does carry information. It carries information about small scales possibly getting ever finer, but this type of space is hard to form an asymptotic picture of what the solution is doing because it's leaving it at infinite time. In the 60s, I think, uh, Udovich ex extended this type of existence statement to a type of weak solution where essentially you can just replace C alpha with L infinity. So you can just take bounded vorticity and that propagates for all time. The advantage of L infinity in this statement is that the bounds are uniform. Since the vorticity is just transported, its maximum can never increase. Or minimum. So in this space, you could hope to have some semblance of an asymptotic picture. Now, the question we'd like to ask is, what happens as t goes to infinity? Of course, it's a very difficult question and I'll only address a very small part of it, but let me just say that again, in view of these two results, you can, you can see that there might be two features that have some interplay. One is a coarse large scale structure emerging, which might be some stable feature in topology that doesn't me measure regularity like L infinity, just, just boundedness and vorticity. Um, on the other hand, those stable features may cause filamentation and smaller scales to emerge. And that would be um, quantified, for example, by growth in these stronger spaces like C alpha. Okay, so this depends on the phase space. The different phase spaces tell you different things about what's going on. So a good example of this distinction is for steady states. So that's a good place to start in general if you want to understand long-term behavior. Steady states of this equation are just those fields which satisfy U dog radian vorticity is zero, which is actually just saying that the gradients of vorticity are parallel locally to the gradients of this stream function. Now, some examples of steady states that uh, people in fluids are very familiar with, but maybe otherwise not. Let's consider some cases about domains. So we can take, uh, for example, the periodic channel. And on periodic channel, there are steady states like shear flows. So just the velocity is increasing in magnitude as you go across the channel. It's always pointing down the stream. Another good example is on a disk domain, you just have circular vortices. Okay, and these all satisfy that condition. More generally, or well, not necessarily, but another class of um, steady states that aren't so tied to special domains are just vorticities that are some, satisfy some functional relationship with the stream function. And in view of the fact that the Laplacian of stream is the vorticity, 
these are just stream functions that satisfy the following elliptic equation. Okay. And many of these things fall into this category, although not all of them, because it's not necessarily that there's a single valued function f that relates to participant and stream, although locally one always exists. This type of thing is sometimes easy to construct, although it's not always a good equation. A good example being the eigenvalue problem where f is just linear, we can have no solutions, one solution, infinitely many, or many solutions. Um, so, um, so, okay, the character of this equation depends strongly on this f, but there is, um, I should keep track of time. But there is a, um, there are two categories of things that satisfy this equation that have come up classically in the study of fluids. They were introduced by Arnold um, and they have good stability properties in the coarse sense I mentioned above. So if F satisfies one of the two conditions, one of these two conditions, um, then that steady state generated by solution of this equation is stable in the L2 topology of vorticity. Okay. And steady state. Stable in L2. And examples of things in this category on the disk or the channel are exactly certain shear profiles. For example, if you have a monotone shear, then it's stable in this sense, or if you have a radially decreasing vortex, where it, uh, it, vorticity decreases as you go out, again, it's stable in this sense. And this type of stability is something that you should regard, I guess, as if you look at the fluid without your glasses and it's sort of smudged out, the picture, the overall large scale picture is remaining the same for all time. So it's capturing this persistent coherent structure. But at the same time, if you imagine one of these persistent coherent structures existing and you put a little perturbation, a little blob, while it may not destroy the large scale feature, over time, this thing is going to filament out. And that, you know, because there's a relative velocity, so it's going to get stretched and go to small scale. And that type of filamentation is exactly the mechanism for the large C1 alpha or C alpha group. So stability in these weaker spaces is mechanism for instability in these stronger ones. Okay. And so quantifying that is a, a theorem by Ka in 2002 that makes the following statement. So if so omega bar is a steady state of Euler is stable in the C alpha topology, then omega bar is isochronal. Okay, so what does isochronal mean? That's sort of the key point, and this is also the title of the talk. So isochronal is a Euler solution whose Lagrangian flow, that diffeomorphism, is time periodic. Okay, so let me just draw a picture. Here's the disk, and let me put two arrows like a clock. So if that time is zero, this is the configuration, then these things move around, around, around. is 12 hours. So this is something where all, if you just put dye in the fluid and you just let it run, at some point, it'll resonate with what it was initially, just repeat the same pattern. So there's some creative license in calling this a clock because at best, well, I mean, if you do your best, it can be right at least twice a day. So in that sense, it has some advantage over a stopped clock, but it's still not really a clock. Anyway. Um, the point about these isochronal ones is this mechanism for stretching perturbations fails for them, I mean, at least naively, because particles always come back to where they are initially, so you can never have this sort of uh, passive irreversible stretching. Okay. Right. 
So there's a question. So, okay. But this theorem nevertheless says that most steady states, since, since most in a very clear sense are not isochronal, most steady states create small scales, even those that have these large scale persistent features. And a natural question is, is it all steady states? Can you remove isochronal? Are these, the, these fluid clocks, are they also unstable? And the fact that sort of all steady states should be unstable is something that you don't conjectured. He, he thought a lot about these problems. And in the remaining time, which is probably not much, I just want to make a couple of remarks about this issue. So, so with Tarek, I'll give you. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the conjecture is isochronal. Oh, the conjecture is that isochronal flows are also unstable in C alpha. All unstable. Yeah, everything unstable. Is. Okay. Yeah. So with Tarek, we thought about this problem um, through the lens of trying to characterize isochronal flows. And so a couple of remarks. First, there exists unique isochronal flow on the disk. Okay, that's really simple to see. Uh, isochronal flows have to satisfy this equation for F switches. But moreover, they can only have one critical point inside the domain. Otherwise, there would be a, a stagnation line making the period of the revolution on streamlines change. So you can think of it as a positive solution to this problem. And so then these rigidity results like Gidas and Nirenberg allow you to conclude that any isochronal flow on the disk is radial, circular flow. And the only circular flow that's isochronal is solid body rotation. So it has to be of the form U is R E phase. Now, what about if you're near a disk? Can you find these fluid clocks on domains that are slight deformations? And the answer to this question is yes. The basic idea is you want to deform. I'm drawing the streamlines and the domain. You want to destroy, you want to deform the radial guy to some other domain by means of some, say, volume preserving diffeomorphism gamma. Here's a new domain M prime, which is just gamma by the M. And if you can find an Euler solution on this domain, which is on the orbit in the diffeomorphism group volume preserving of the stream function on the original domain, then that will be another isochronal state. Okay. And the reason is that by the coarea formula, if you want to know the period of revolution on a streamline, so say here's a streamline, psi equals c, and you want to know how long it takes a particle to come back to itself on this periodic orbit, well, that's just some explicit formula involving the line integral around the orbit of that streamline. And by the coarea formula, this is nothing but the rate of change of the area enclosed by that streamline as you vary the level. So if you find something on the area preserving group on, on its orbit, those areas are all preserved. So the levels are preserved and also the areas enclosed by them are preserved. So automatically, if something's isochronal here and you find something like this there, then it's also isochronal there. And so there's a theorem that we have with Peter Constantine and Dan Ginsburg which allows us basically to uniquely do this construction to find a, a unique uh, object on the orbit of the original stream function on a new domain. And applying that theorem allows us to generate new isochronal flows on these deformed, deformed uh, vessels and the unique such there. Okay. So, so Tarek and I conjecture that uh, for each domain, there exists a unique isochronal flow up to, uh, up to scalings. And this is at least true near disks. 
Okay, so maybe that's it. 